So today we will continue with our discussion of spontaneous symmetry breaking. And the last time we gave a lot of general theorems, in particular the Goldstone theorem was established in two different ways, using on the one hand the effective action and on the other hand uh, operator methods and uh, current properties leading to a kellin lehmann representation and the existence of massless particles. And today we will do a physics application of for spontaneous symmetry breaking where you see in a direct illustration uh, how spontaneous symmetry breaking affects properties of uh, physical states, particles and their interactions. And the example that we are going to look at, I already hinted at the example last time, uh, is probably a little bit non-obvious for some of you because we will look at QCD and the strong interactions. Actually, QCD has a lot of symmetries, not only color gauge invariants, but also some other symmetries that we will explore, and some of those are spontaneously broken. And this pattern of uh, symmetries and partially spontaneous symmetry breaking has a big impact on properties of QCD bound states, namely the hadrons like pions and other mesons and baryons, and uh, how we can understand their properties in terms of just looking at symmetries is the topic of today's lecture. So let me start. This is section 4.5. An example for the strong interactions. So namely, there is a global uh, so-called flavor symmetry which has really not much or in some sense nothing to do with color symmetry and color gauge invariance. It is an independent symmetry which is also true in QCD. And that is partially spontaneously broken. Actually, it also has partially anomalies. However, we will not discuss those aspects of the symmetries which are broken by anomalies. Um, but you see that there is really a complicated pattern of uh, symmetries which are partially unbroken, partially spontaneously broken, and partially broken by anomalous quantum effects. And all of this together has, of course, phenomenological implications. Okay, so let's begin by uh, investigating which symmetries does QCD actually have. And let us look at the case first where we only consider two flavors, two quark types, namely the up quark and the down quark. Let us consider a world where there are only two types of quarks and we ignore the weak interactions and we also ignore the electromagnetic interactions. We only consider strong interactions between these two types of quarks up and down. And uh, to make it even simpler, we also at first neglect the masses of the quarks and set the up and down quark mass to zero. Under this condition, we have in our theory spinors for the quarks. Let's call them Q. And the spinors can be decomposed into left-handed and right-handed parts by applying the gamma 5 projection operator that you know. Uh, do I need to define left and right-handed spinors? No. OK. So, then the Lagrangian for QCD uh, is well known and it looks like this. U bar I D slash U plus D bar I D slash D. That's it. 
and uh, the covariant derivative capital D here contains the gluons and uh, the color representation matrices under which the quarks transform. So the quark fields here carry a color index which I do not write down explicitly, but it is hidden. Let us decompose the Lagrangian into the left-handed and right-handed parts of the Spinos. If we do that, then uh, such a term with gamma mu in between um, decomposes into u left bar id slash u left plus the same with right. Let's first write d bar left id slash d left plus u right bar id slash u right plus d right bar id slash d right. Okay, so the Lagrangian splits into four terms with four t uh, times kinetic um, terms and covariant derivatives and the left-handed and the right-handed quarks appear completely in a separated way. Uh, as you know, um, left-handed quarks and right-handed quarks uh, transform differently and independently under Lorentz transformations. Therefore, they are really completely separated objects. They cannot mix under Lorentz transformations. Therefore, they are really behaving as independent quantum fields. But they combine to full Dirac spinors, which then uh, describe the uh, um, full quarks and antiquarks with all possible um, chiralities. But uh, we can split the Lagrangian in this way. So if we have this Lagrangian, then we can read off immediately a symmetry, namely a flavor symmetry. And uh, this becomes even easier to write down if we introduce a quark doublet. Q left consists of U L and D L and Q right, which consists of U right and D right. And that looks a little bit similar to what we do in the electroweak standard model, but it is not the same. In particular, the right-handed quark doublet doesn't exist in the electroweak standard model. It makes no sense there because it's not a gauge multiplet, but here we uh, write it like this and then we explore the properties. Obviously, we can then uh, put this Lagrangian into a form which depends on these doublets and we can do a transformation. QL transforms with a two by two matrix, UL times the QL vector and Q right transforms with a matrix Q right times the Q right vector where both of these matrices UL and R are SU2 matrices. So we can do two such uh, two by two matrix transformations and if we apply this transformation onto the Lagrangian, then the Lagrangian stays invariant because uh, this here can be written, let's say, uh, let me write it here like this, QL bar ID slash QL plus QR bar ID slash QR. And uh, then if you apply those matrices, and the matrices are X independent, of course, then U dagger times U appears, which drops out, and therefore the Lagrangian is invariant. So L goes to L. And that means the Lagrangian has a symmetry. And what symmetry is it? What is the group? The group is SU2 cross SU2. And the name is SU2 left cross SU2 right flavor symmetry. This is a symmetry that the QCD Lagrangian simply possesses, even though we uh, might not have thought about this symmetry when we invented the QCD Lagrangian. Nevertheless, it is a symmetry, and therefore it inevitably um, governs the properties of QCD. Um, now, let's switch on the masses. What happens if we have a mass term, Lm, which can be written as minus QL bar times a matrix Mu, Md, 0, 0, Qr, plus the Hermitian conjugate. 
then of course, uh, or not of course, but what happens with the symmetry? If you apply uh, the matrix UL and UR, then the matrices UL and UR, they do not drop out of the mass term. Um, if the masses were equal, then a subgroup would drop out, namely if UL is equal to UR. Um, but if the masses are different, then uh, the symmetry is completely broken by the mass term. So therefore, this breaks uh, SU2 L cross SU2 R explicitly. And uh, technically, one could mention that the breaking is uh, so-called soft, where soft means that the breaking comes from a dimension three operator. So at very high energies, a dimension three operator is less important than a dimension four operator. And you can simply imagine this by going to very high energies and then comparing this term and that term. And high energies basically mean that the derivatives inside of this, uh, which are proportional to the energy, become very large. And then the derivative term is much more important than the mass term, which doesn't become large at high energies. And so in that sense, the breaking is weak and becomes unimportant at high energies. However, at low energies, it uh, can remain important. Anyway, this is an explicit breaking. And we might investigate, therefore, QCD uh, in the limit where the quark masses vanish. Then the symmetry SU2 cross SU2 becomes exact. And then we might study the quark masses in the sense of a small perturbation, which breaks the symmetry a little bit and therefore modifies the effects of the symmetries slightly. We can also look at a generalization, namely what happens if we have three flavors. You could then write QL equal UL, DL, and SL. QR equal UR, DR, SR. And now you see that it's really different from the electroweak standard model. It's got a completely different way to look at the fields. We have now a flavor triplet of three quark flavors, UDS, the three lightest quarks. And uh, you could write down the Lagrangian, including the strange quark. And then if you neglect all quark masses, you would get, uh, so let's say if MUDS is 0, then you would have obviously in the same sense SU3 left cross SU3 right flavor symmetry. But uh, if you switch on the quarks, then this flavor symmetry would also be explicitly broken. And now the interesting thing is the strange quark mass is clearly much bigger than the up and down quark masses. So uh, at first, you would have to switch on the strange quark mass. This is a big perturbation of that symmetry. And uh, let's say uh, strongly broken by ms. And if you uh, only switch on the strange quark mass, then the SU3 cross SU3 would be broken explicitly. And the remaining symmetry would be SU2 cross SU2. And if you then switch on also U and D quark masses, then SE2 cross SE2 would also be broken, but more weakly. And so in this sense, you get a hierarchy of symmetries. And you can study the impact of all those symmetry in stages and look at the breaking also in a hierarchical way, and therefore understand the impact of all of this on the hadron spectrum. And in order to give you a feeling and an understanding what can happen in consequence of such symmetries, we will look at the simplest case today, where we look at this SU2 cross SU2 symmetry without quark masses, and look at the consequences coming from there. And then you can probably imagine how one could go on. And actually, this third case is an exercise where you look at the meson spectrum, uh, which follows from this SU3 cross SU3 flavor symmetry. Let us uh, do something technical. We can rewrite the flavor symmetry 
slightly. Uh, the first uh, obvious definition comes uh, from the left-handed and the right-handed quarks, and uh, this corresponds to an infinitesimal transformation. Q goes to Q plus delta Q, uh, and the matrix U can be written as the uh, unit matrix minus I alpha A times Pauli matrix sigma A over 2 plus higher orders in the alpha. So in this way you can write an infinitesimal SU2 matrix. So the Pauli matrices are the generators of SU2 and therefore uh, this generates the infinitesimal transformation and then the original uh, transformation corresponding to SU2 left cross SU2 right is the following. Delta Q is written like this minus I times, we have an alpha left for the left-handed transformation, uh, A times sigma A over 2 times the left-handed projection operator plus alpha right A, Pauli matrix sigma A over 2 times the right-handed projection operator. And all of that acts onto the quark field. And then this part generates the transformation of the left-handed that part generates the transformation of the right-handed, and the transformations involve two times three independent alphas, uh, because we have a six-parameter Lie group transformation. But now we can equivalently rewrite this by writing the left and right-handed projectors. Uh, P left and right is one minus or plus gamma five over two. Then this can be equivalently written like this. Delta Q is equal to minus I, let's say, alpha A sigma A over 2 minus beta A sigma A over 2 times gamma 5 acting on Q. And this is just forming linear combinations. Uh, let's say uh, alpha corresponds to the unit matrix part of the projectors. So Alpha A is here alpha L A plus alpha R A divided by 2. And beta A is given by alpha L A minus alpha R A divided by 2. So it is just an equivalent way to rewrite the symmetry. And then you can see here the alphas. What kind of generation do they, uh, what kind of transformation do they generate? They generate a transformation where the entire quark field left plus right uniformly transforms. So the entire quark is treated as a whole and that uh, has the name vectorial symmetry. So it's a vectorial symmetry where the left and right handed quark fields transform equally. And that is the opposite. So this transforms the left handed part with the opposite sign compared to the right handed part. And that is called an axial transformation. Or axial symmetry. And uh, a uh, small subtlety which is not very important is that the axial, or the vector part that forms a subgroup of SU2 cross SU2. So if you uh, look at the commutation relations between only the alpha part, then that closes into the alphas. However, if you do commutation relations between the betas, then appears gamma 5 square, which is the unit matrix. So the beta transformations do not form a group. They do not close uh, into each other. So that is no subgroup. That is maybe interesting to keep in mind in order to avoid misunderstandings at some points. Now, having defined the symmetry content, we can now explore the consequences and we look at a two flavor model. which is a model by Gelman and Levy from 1960. So it's quite historical, but nevertheless still of interest. And so we have this quark field, uh, 
QLR is equal to ULR and DLR. We take seriously the SU2 left cross SU2 right symmetry and ask how is this reflected on hadrons. So first we need to ask which hadrons do we want to consider and we want to consider the lightest baryons and mesons which are composed out of up and down quarks and uh, among the baryons the well-known ones are the proton and the neutron they are three quark bound states with spin one half overall and let us consider them both and we introduce it as a doublet capital N which consists here of the proton and the neutron. And we imagine now, maybe that was not so easy at the time of Gelman and Levy, but now we imagine that the proton and neutron are composed of UUD quarks and DUD quarks. Okay. And uh, because of this decomposition, we have now an idea how would this SU2 left cross SU2 right flavor symmetry for the quarks manifest itself on the doublet of proton and neutron. As you see here from this decomposition, the basic difference is that uh, two quarks are equal and one up quark is replaced by a down quark. Therefore, we imagine and hypothesize that the uh, nucleon doublet behaves identically as a quark doublet. So that it would transform exactly in this way uh, that we wrote down here under our six vector and axial transformations. So therefore, we hypothesize that delta n under the SU2 left cross SU2 symmetry is minus i alpha a sigma a over 2 uh, minus beta a sigma a over 2 gamma 5 acting on n. And that is simply an ansatz um, uh, which is an hypothesis and it corresponds to our intuitive way of understanding the flavor symmetry on the level of baryons and then we will explore the consequences of this ansatz. Okay, so the next step is a little bit less obvious. Namely, we look at mesons. What are mesons? Mesons are these quark-antiquark bound states like pions, for example, or kaons. And uh, we have at our disposal up and down quarks, so there would be bound states like u bar u, u bar d, uh, d bar u, d bar d. So in a way you can understand that maybe we should expect four different uh, kinds of mesons. In our simplistic way of thinking, and from observation, we know that there are three light pions, which are pseudoscalar. So let's use this as an experimental input. And then we create uh, three pseudoscalar mesons out of those um, quark pairs. And uh, let's call them pions pi i. And we imagine that they are composed out of the quarks and antiquarks uh, with a gamma 5 in between because the gamma 5 makes it pseudoscalar. In other words, um, it gets a minus under parity reflections. So the pions could be written in terms of the quarks as Q bar times I gamma 5 times sigma I over 2 times Q. So that would be the quark representation. And what that means is that, first of all, 
between Q bar and Q there is I gamma 5, which makes it pseudo scalar. Uh, so it connects um, Q bar left with Q right minus Q bar right uh, times Q left. Um, and the sigma i uh, acts on the doublet structure. So for example, pi 1 would be uh, up quark times down quark plus down quark times up quark. Or uh, pi 2 would be up quark times down quark minus down quark times up quark. Pi 3 would be up, up, minus, down, down, that sort of thing. So we get here in this way three um, meson-like states which have the correct pseudo-scalar behavior, and we have a doublet, uh, a triplet. And uh, as we will see, if we now apply a flavor symmetry transformation onto this, then it doesn't close under itself. So SU2 cross SU2 flavor transformations acting on pions lead to something which is not a pion. So in order to write down a closed system of transformations, we indeed need a fourth meson state, and you could do some calculations to, until you figure out what kind of fourth meson state you need, such that you get a closed system of transformations, and I will just tell you. So this is not closed under SU2 left cross SU2 right. Therefore, we add a hypothetical uh, fourth meson, which we call sigma. And actually, that is not really observed in this form. So uh, to say it up front, and in order not to confuse you at the end, the properties that we will derive for the sigma will not correspond to anything that is observed like this in experiment, but the properties we will derive for the pions and the nucleons, they are um, in agreement with what is observed, and so here at this point the model simply fails to describe nature, but uh, in the other aspects the model does not fail, and it gives a very simple way to understand important properties of hadrons, and we will discuss in detail how and why. Okay, so anyway, that is the ansatz, and let us now assume flavor transformations. Ah, I didn't tell you what the sigma is. The sigma should, of course, correspond to the following ansatz, namely the simplest possible ansatz, Q bar times one half the unit matrix times Q. So there is no I times gamma 5 and no Pauli matrix in between, so that would really be a bound state like up quark times uh, U, U bar plus D, D bar, as simple as that, without any relative minus signs and so on, whereas here there are all sorts of minus signs appearing. So that is the simplest imaginable state. And then let us now assume uh, the following. So if we write down our sigma and pi i fields, then we imagine a transformation like this. We will now do a small calculation based on this intuition that the quark content of the mesons is like that, and then we will look at those objects and see how they behave under the flavor transformation, and then we uh, use the outcome and postulate that the sigma and pi have exactly that transformation law. So the calculation works as follows. We look at this um, content here. Um, let's write it down explicitly. U D bar. Um, and let's say uh, here I will put the content of the pi, which is one half times the unit matrix, and the content of the pi uh, of the sigma and the pi i gamma five times sigma i over two. And here I will now write the transformation law of u and d bar 
and in the next line we do times the transformation law acting on UD. Okay, and in this way you, uh, I want you to understand the structure. So what I wrote so far is the original sigma and pi uh, combined in this uh, curly bracket notation. And now let's do the transformation. There is one transformation from here and one transformation from here. Let's start with the lower one because that is the original transformation. The lower one has here times one minus I alpha A, uh, what was it? Sigma A over two. Then minus I, sorry, plus I beta A sigma A over two gamma five, okay? So if that is the transformation of UD, what is then the transformation of the barred spinor? It goes to the right one, and then uh, under barring, uh, we get first of all minus i becomes plus i, alpha i, sigma a over two. Sigma Pauli matrices are Hermitian, so they do not change. And then here, plus i becomes minus i, but gamma five under the bar operation becomes minus gamma five. So we get minus times minus gives again um, plus i beta a sigma a over two gamma five because gamma five bar is equal to minus gamma five. That enters here. And therefore the relative signs of alpha and beta behave differently in the two uh, transformation laws here. Okay, and now we have to work it out. Uh, there is something to be worked out because there are lots of Pauli matrices. The pions are defined via Pauli matrices, which act on these UNDs. And the transformation laws are also defined in terms of Pauli matrices, which also act on the UND. So we get commutators or anti-commutators between Pauli matrices. And uh, we get products of gamma five square gives the unit matrix and so on. Uh, up to gamma five cube appears. And so let's work it out uh, completely, uh, of course, to the infinitesimal level. In other words, we neglect products of alphas and betas. We only take linear terms. Um, but let's see what happens. So, okay, how should we organize this? Let's simply write a huge curly bracket and let's put here into the first um, column the result which we get if we multiply that round bracket times one half times the other round bracket. What do we get? One half is just a number. Then we have one times one times one half is one half, obviously. Then the alpha part. Alpha part times one half minus alpha part times one half. Alpha minus alpha simply drops out. So the alphas here drop out. Then beta, beta stuff times one half plus the same beta stuff times one half just adds up and we get plus uh, one half times two i beta a sigma a over two gamma five. And that is already the result for the sigma transformation. So the sigma would transform only with the betas but not with the alphas. That is one result of this little calculation. Now let's do the same for the pions. So we have to work out that round bracket times i gamma five sigma i times the other round bracket to linear order in the alphas. So first we get the first order term, i gamma five sigma i over two. Then from the alphas we get alpha times that um, times one plus one times that times minus i alpha at linear order. This simply generates the commutator between the alpha stuff and that part. So we get exactly the commutator of this expression times that expression. So let's write it as a commutator because why not? So we get plus commutator of i alpha a sigma a over two comma i gamma five sigma i over two. 
It's exactly that commutator that we get. And then from the beta, we get here beta times this plus uh, this times the same beta. This gives the anti-commutator. So we get plus the anti-commutator of i beta a sigma a over 2 gamma 5 comma i gamma 5 sigma i over 2. Can you actually read this? Okay. Okay, in the first line, at least. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's work it out. Equal u d bar times one half plus one half times two i uh, beta a sigma a over two gamma five comma. Okay, and the other result, i gamma 5 sigma i over 2. And what is the result of the commutator between two Pauli matrices? It is, of course, an epsilon tensor plus, so first of all, we have here my i square gives minus 1. Then i times the epsilon tensor minus i epsilon tensor with index a i j times sigma j over 2. That is the anti-commutator between the Pauli matrices, and the rest is just the prefactor times alpha a times gamma 5. Yeah. Then the anti-commutator between two Pauli matrices um, is a Kronecker delta. And here, Pauli matrix over 2 anti-commutator gives one half times Kronecker delta. So therefore, the anti-commute on gamma 5 square gives one. So here we simply get a minus because of the i square times beta a um, Kronecker delta. So we get beta i with a fixed index i times nothing else times one half. Okay, that is our little calculation, which gives us the intuition and motivation how we should expect that the sigma and pi transforms. What is the result? So pa sigma corresponds to the first term here before the comma, and sigma transforms into um, the object which corresponds to uh, this thing between the quark vectors. So the one half corresponds again to sigma itself. And here we have in between sigma a over 2 times i gamma 5 that corresponds to the pions. So we see that sigma transforms into itself plus pions times beta prefactors. So what is it exactly? So delta, sigma, and pi i. So let's only look at the variation. Is here the following. So this is directly um, the one half cancels. Beta A times pi A. That is the transformation law of sigma. And the same for the pions. So here, the change of the pions is this one. So here we get I gamma 5 times sigma J over 2. That is again a pion with index j times minus epsilon tensor alpha a. So we get minus epsilon a i j alpha a pi j. And uh, here we get something proportional to sigma, namely minus beta i times sigma. And there you have it. That is the transformation law of the sigma and pion field that we should expect if uh, that is our intuition for the quark structure of all these mesons. We can write it in a little bit different way using vector notation. If we write the pions as a vector, where i corresponds to 1, 2, 3 gives a vector, then this is simply sigma goes to beta vector times pi vector, 
and that is the cross product alpha vector cross pi vector minus beta vector times sigma. And then we have two hypothetical transformation laws which motivate a model based on uh, the content of baryons, nucleons, proton and, um, proton and neutron, and four mesons, sigma and pi. Uh, they now correspond to fundamental fields in a quantum field theory, and we postulate that the field theory should be invariant under this transformation, which corresponds to the SU2 left cross SU2 right flavor symmetry of the fundamental QCD, which should be reflected also on the level of mesons. So let's write this as a sentence. So this motivates um, an effective Lagrangian for these fields, which is invariant under this symmetry. And uh, what that basically means, it encapsulates our knowledge of um, QCD symmetry on the level of patrons. So I need some space and then we can write down the Lagrangian which corresponds to this idea. So the invariant Lagrangian looks like this. L is equal to one half d mu sigma square plus one half d mu pi square. So these are four kinetic terms for all our mesons. Then we have a kinetic term for the nucleons, n bar i gamma mu d mu n, without covariant derivative because there is no gauge interaction in this theory. And then we have a Yukawa type interaction term between the scalars and the fermions, coupling constant g times n bar sigma plus 2i sigma i over 2 pi i gamma 5 times n. That is a complicated interaction between the nucleons and uh, all the mesons, sigma and pions. And there is a potential minus v which depends on sigma square plus pi square. So this is an ansatz, and it is important that this ansatz is symmetric under the SU2 cross SU2 symmetry, namely under exactly this symmetry and the corresponding one for the nucleons. Let us uh, check it partially, but not completely.
Okay, um, so let us go on. We see that the masslessness of the pions is explained directly by the pattern of spontaneous symmetry breaking of uh, uh, this structure of um, six to three generators. Let us go on and see what else happens. So as often we look at the bilinear part of the Lagrangian after spontaneous symmetry breaking, then uh, we do have the usual derivative terms, but lo let's look in particular at the nucleon now, n bar i gamma mu d mu n. And now from the interaction between the nucleon and the sigma, we get something if the sigma has a vacuum expectation value, because then we get a bilinear term where sigma is replaced by its VEF. So we get plus g times sigma zero, which is a constant, times n bar n. That is a mass term for the nucleon. So we see that the nucleons now get a mass by coupling to the vacuum expectation value of the sigma. And so we get a spontaneous generation of nucleon masses as well. And the masses can be as heavy as you want by adjusting the coupling constant and the vacuum expectation value. Therefore, it is very understandable that the nucleon masses are way heavier than the pion masses. Even if the pion masses would be not exactly zero because of some small breaking of the symmetry, the nucleons can be way heavier. And also, what is about the sigma mass? The pions have a mass which is zero, the nucleons have a mass which is coming from the uh, coupling to the vacuum expectation value. What do we know about the sigma mass? Where does it come from? From which term in the Lagrangian or which interaction? Does it have to be zero or does it have to be anything particular? The sigma behaves similarly to the Higgs field in the standard model, right? Yeah, so yeah. from the potential. Yes, exactly. So it comes from the potential. And do you see any uh, value that the sigma mass should have if it comes from the potential? It is related to the second derivative of the potential at the minimum, right? And what do we know about the second derivative of the potential at the minimum? Nothing. Therefore, the sigma mass could be anything, and it is totally unconstrained by this symmetry discussion. And so in this way, you can maybe also understand how it can be that the model is partially correct and partially wrong. As I said in the beginning, the sigma particle is not observed in nature in this direct form. There are particles where uh, experimentalists and theory debate whether they correspond to the sigma, but there is for sure not a unique particle which exactly has the properties of the sigma of this model. However, the pions are very well described by the model and also the nucleons are described well by the model. And the reason is that the properties of the nucleons and the pions follow directly from the symmetry. There is nothing else except for symmetry arguments that we need to know in order to infer the masslessness and the mass of those particles. And therefore, since the symmetry is a true symmetry of QCD, the consequences of the model reflect the true properties of QCD for those particles. Whereas the sigma properties have nothing to do with the symmetry, and therefore uh, here the properties are completely off. So it tells you that symmetries have a strong power, uh, a predictive power, and we use that here by just using a simplified ansatz model. And uh, Therefore, those properties of the model which come directly from the symmetry are quite correct. 
let us uh, do a little bit more of the physical consequences. There are the unbroken symmetries, namely the vectorial SU2 symmetry, which is, which is not spontaneously broken. So there is this SU2 vectorial. This would give rise to operators QA, A equal 1, 2, 3. And these operators correspond to transformations corresponding to this SU2 vector, which you can really implement on the Hilbert space of quantum states. There would be a property such as QA commutes with a Hamiltonian. But on the other hand, a commutator of QA with QB satisfies the SU2 commutation relations. And QA acting onto the true vacuum of the theory is zero. So that means we have a true symmetry. It can be implemented on the quantum theory by operators which commute with the Hamiltonian, which satisfy internal commutation relations and the vacuum is invariant. So all of this is true for that remaining SU2 vectorial symmetry. And then from such relationships, you can show that the particle states, the one particle states, they have of course certain relationships with respect to those QAs and that means in particular that the particles will fall into multiplets of this symmetry. In the same sense as you would have angular momentum symmetry, so that has the same uh, commutation relations as angular momentum. So just like if you have a rotationally invariant system, the states uh, can be grouped according to angular momentum eigenstates with uh, angular momentum one half, one, uh, three half and so on. And then you have doublets, triplets, and so on. And here it is exactly the same. So it is clear that the mass eigenstates form um, SU2 V multiplets. And that is like angular momentum. And so indeed, uh, that is the case. We have the proton and neutron. The nucleons, they form a doublet. We have the pions, pi 1, 2, 3, which form a triplet under this um, symmetry of the vacuum. And so it would have to go on. And so the nucleons in this theory, they would have equal mass which also comes out of the Lagrangian, and the pions would also have equal mass, which in addition is actually zero because they are Goldstone bosons. So all in all, we can say that you can understand a lot about the Hadron spectrum from symmetries. So let's say purely based on symmetry arguments. Now uh, I say it again, the sigma field is not constrained by symmetries and it is not observed in this form. And one could find an optimized model, which is a little bit more complicated. An optimized uh, quantum field theory model would be one where the sigma field about which we know nothing is eliminated completely from the Lagrangian. That would be the nonlinear sigma model. And in such a model, you would really only have the pions and nucleons, or even only the pions, and you would be able to study the physics of that really based on symmetries, and then the uh, results and conclusions are quite firm. Now, 
Uh, all of this um, is a nice consequence, I hope, and uh, hope you appreciate uh, how much uh, we can conclude from symmetry principles alone. And of course, this is just the starting point. We could do the same for SU3 cross SU3, including the strange quark, and one could do many more consequences like interactions between pions and nucleons and so on. But let me mention another point. All of this was based on uh, the observation that QCD has the fundamental symmetry. And that is a um, clearly uh, established fact. But there is another ingredient, namely to say that the SU2 cross SU2 must be spontaneously broken. And that came from experiment. So it just came from experiment that if we assume it is unbroken, then we get a conclusion which is wrong. If we assume that it is spontaneously broken, we apparently get a conclusion which is correct. So, but uh, it would be nice if one could directly prove from QCD that the symmetry is spontaneously broken. And that is not so easy. So let me write that down. So QCD would have to be the dynamical reason for this spontaneous symmetry breaking. And that is actually one of those unsolved big problems in theoretical physics, to solve the non-perturbative dynamics of QCD such that you can really derive rigorously that QCD predicts uh, the spontaneous symmetry pattern. So it is not yet rigorously proven. So of course we expect it to be true, first from experiment and also there are lots of evidences from uh, non-perturbative calculations based on lattice simulations for example. So it is uh, basically clear that it is true. However, it would be, of course, nice to have a rigorous mathematical proof, and that is actually one of those million dollar problems uh, in mathematics. So there is something for you to be done. Okay, how much time do we have? I think we have still some time. So let me go on. and tell you a little bit of some outlooks. Simply um, give you some items of what happens and what you can do uh, if you want to go on in this direction. So first, do you have some questions? No. OK, so one first outlook would be explicit symmetry breaking. As we said in the beginning, actually all of this is not completely true because there are quark masses and the quark masses break the symmetry, but only weakly. So let's look at this. So actually the QCD Lagrangian contains this term minus QL bar MU 0, 0, MD QR plus the Hermitian conjugate of this. And that is an explicit SU2L cross SU2R breaking. OK, but it is a weak breaking. And of course, you can now study physics uh, in the limit where the quark masses go to 0 and use the quark masses as a small perturbation of the symmetric situation. And in other words, we start from the symmetric case, take all the consequences, then we switch on slowly very small quark masses and study what is the impact of all the quark masses, let's say at first order in the quark masses on all of our consequences. And the obvious consequence is of course, if we do not have a symmetry, then the spontaneous breaking doesn't have to lead to massless particles. And so, uh, the consequence of the symmetry is the masslessness of scalars of the pion masses. And the true parameter of this is the mass square. 
So the mass square is really the object which uh, must be zero according to uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking in Goldstone's theorem. And uh, so what happens if the pion mass is non-zero? Is that the pion mass square is basically the direct consequence of Goldstone's theorem. And instead of being zero, there is now a perturbation. And in first order of the quark masses, the perturbation is exactly linear in the quark masses. And therefore, that must mean that the pion mass is linear in the quark masses. So you get a relationship that the pion mass square depends on the quark masses to linear order because the pion mass arises not as constituent masses and so on, uh, some of the two quark masses gives the pion mass, but the pion mass arises dynamically from symmetry breaking effects and the symmetry is violated by this effect. So this is a very clear and important illustration for something which is uh, generally true for all the hadrons, as you uh, certainly know. Namely, <coughs> pion mass is definitely not the same as the sum of the constituent masses. Uh, maybe not even sum of constituent masses plus some small binding energy. But it is very different. So the nature of the pion mass is very different. And of course, you have all heard, I hope, the statement that most of the mass in the universe, or at least uh, on Earth, the mass of atoms does not come from the Higgs mechanism, but the mass comes from hadronic effects. So most of the mass uh, is hadronic binding energy. And you see that here, the constituent masses, like the quark masses, they come from the Higgs mechanism, but they only give a small perturbation uh, to all the masses of hadrons. So of course, in the pion mass, you have this relationship. For the nucleons, uh, the majority of the nucleon masses comes from that coupling to the background vacuum expectation value. And so the nucleon masses, if uh, way, way bigger than the constituent quark masses. So there also the quark masses would be a small perturbation to that main effect, but the main effect is, uh, is main. And therefore, the majority of the nucleon masses and therefore the majority of all the masses of all atoms uh, comes from hadronic binding effects and not from constituents. And uh, the Higgs mechanism gives mass to the constituents, but not to the hadronic binding energies. So that is important to note, and it is best illustrated in the case of the pion. OK, then some further outlook. So you can include the strange quark Then you have SU3 left cross SU3 right. And uh, it has a stronger breaking, of course. And you can study uh, basically the same, including the strange quark, then derive consequences where the strange quark is set to zero, then use the strange quark mass as a perturbation, and so on, and go step by step. And then you would describe, uh, of course, mesons and baryons, in particular mesons, which are also containing the strange quark, for example, the kaon and uh, the eta meson. Then you can systematically e eliminate the heavy fields and retain only light fields. And that is important for two reasons. First of all, only the light fields are really constrained by the symmetries.
And uh, second, in quantum field theory, you can always eliminate heavy degrees of freedom and uh, derive an effective theory for only the light degrees of freedom, where the effects of heavy fields uh, corresponds to parameters in the Lagrangian of the light fields. And so if you do that, then you end up with a very systematic approach which can formulate the symmetry um, structure for the light fields and you can really systematically and correctly, rigorously derive the properties of the light fields, their masses and their interactions uh, following from the symmetries. And this approach is called chiral perturbation theory. This is an effective field theory which is uh, used frequently in order to get uh, a handle on low energy properties of hadrons. Then you can also include QED effects. For example, uh, in the case of pions, you have a neutral pion and charged pions. The charged pions interact directly with the photon. The neutral pion does not directly interact with the photon. And so, for example, that could give corrections to the mass of the charged pions because of electromagnetic interactions, but not uh, to the neutral pion, and so on. And you can also Uh, consider an additional symmetry, namely the following U1 A symmetry. What is the meaning of this U1 A symmetry? In fact, you could have asked me immediately right from the beginning, why did I assume so far SU2 transformations? We started with saying the Lagrangian was invariant under SU2 transformations. And I said QL, the quark uh, doublet spinor, goes into a matrix UL times QL. And the Lagrangian was invariant because U dagger U drops out. But why did it have to be SU2? It could have been U2 instead of SU2. So there is nothing which required the determinant to be 1. So. I did that because I didn't want to consider the U1 axial transformation. This difference between SU2 and U2 corresponds to an overall phase. So let us now consider this transformation where QL just transforms with an overall phase. That would be basically a unit matrix with phases on the diagonal. And that is, of course, a matrix which is an element of U2 but not of SU2. So that's exactly the different difference uh, in the transformations. And uh, one could study a vectorial U1 where left and right transform with the same phase. That is really not interesting because it just corresponds to overall fermion number, which uh, is kind of a trivial symmetry. Therefore, the interesting thing is exactly the opposite, where left and right transform with opposite phases, e to the minus i alpha l. QR, okay, and that is an axial transformation, and that is something that you can also investigate, and we could have done it right from the beginning, however, then we would have had a problem, because this symmetry actually has an anomaly, so that also has an interesting fate in the theory, so it's a true symmetry of the Lagrangian, um, but not of the quantum theory. And so therefore, studying the effect of that symmetry onto the hadron spectrum involves understanding uh, this anomaly and how you can investigate such anomalous symmetries on the level of uh, some models like this. And uh, we will not do that here, but that is doable. And it is also part of that chiral perturbation theory. And you can incorporate it. And then this leads, for example, to an understanding of the decay pi zero into gamma gamma, which is connected to such an anomaly of a symmetry in presence of QED effects. 
So once you start adding QED, then you see that uh, there is this anomaly, and uh, that gives rise to the pion decay. And then there is also a puzzle connected to the eta meson, eta and eta prime puzzle. And the resolution of that puzzle also corresponds to understanding how uh, the anomaly of such an axial U1 symmetry comes into play. So this is just an outlook that this is what you can do. So therefore, our choice of the SU2 cross SU2 was uh, based on uh, wanting to avoid the discussion of this anomaly. So our discussion is correct uh, as it stands. And it leads to the effects that we have discussed. But if you go on, then there are additional very interesting effects that can also be studied. And in the exercise, we will focus on this SU2 cross SU2 part where we can study, for example, masses of mesons, including the kaon masses. And we will bring in the strange quark and uh, its mass. And uh, then we will see some mass patterns emerging from the different, uh, strong, uh, differently strong breakings of the various steps of the symmetry. OK, um, yeah, so uh, we have still a few moments, but we can also stop here. So if you have questions, then let me know. Otherwise, this would end our section on QCD. And in the afternoon, we will do another part of spontaneous symmetry breaking connected to gauge theories. And then we will also discuss the Higgs mechanism. Good. OK, so see you then.